Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vagam Radian here at the Excel Center in London, where we're covering the DSCI trade show, world's leading air, land, sea, space, cyber, and security trade show. Our coverage here is in partnership with DSCI and Clarion Events, and we've got with us uh, a, a double header of, a, of an interview. Uh, we have John Damish, who's the chief growth officer here at in situ, which is uh, a Boeing company. Uh, try to make that clear. And we've also got uh, Marine Corps Lieutenant Colonel Brad Green, who is the commanding officer of Marine Unmanned Aer Aerial Vehicle Squadron 2. Uh, which, which is, which is not a not a mouthful, uh, and you guys operate the in situ's blackjack uh, uh, vehicle. John, I want to start with you a little bit. What's new in the zoo? You know, you guys have been constantly updating uh, the product in in high demand, high operational availability platform. Talk to us a little bit about how you keep making uh, the product relevant for folks uh, for folks like Colonel Green here. Yeah, sure. I think one of the most important things to know about in situ is that we're actually a commercial company. Right? We operate commercially, we invest our own money, uh, we also use IRAD money to go continually innovate in the product line uh, and anticipate our customers' needs and then bring those capabilities in front of our customers, like the Marine Corps, uh, so that they can then iterate and build derivative capabilities specific to their mission set. And so, uh, Colonel Green, talk to us a little bit about how you use the vehicle, uh, why it's an advantage, why it's important for Marines, and especially for a Marine application that is, you know, it's got to have a degree of marinization for anything you guys do. It has to have a degree of robustness. And I know that you guys like to carry around lots of very heavy gear. So how does that also fit into the, that was a joke, uh, into the whole uh, whole thing? That's nice. Nice of the question that, that you asked that. So one thing we look at is the expeditionary aspect of blackjack. So we can take it anywhere. We can take it from austere um, sites forward, right close to the battle space, or we can bring it off a ship. So those are some of the attributes, and we don't need a runway to do our job. And, and, and so what are, um, how is it changing the way you guys do business? And the unmanned aerial vehicle squadrons are also a new thing, in the, in the relatively new thing in the Marine Corps. Um, talk to us a little bit about how you guys fit into the Marine Order of Battle, how people think of you, how they use it. The Marines pride themselves on, on being a born joint in, in, in a degree, but, but how, does, how, how is that as a service provider work, for example, in a, in a MAGTAF concept or in a MU concept? Sure, that's a great question. What we do is we're with Blackjack, we're able to go right to um, our customer. So we can put a uh, crew that is sitting right with the um, folks that are conducting the battle in their command operations center. And we can work right directly with them, so there's very little lag uh, and really good coordination. That's probably the biggest attribute. We can move it around the battle space anywhere we need to go and take it wherever, wherever the Marines are. Um, John, let me go back to you. As you look at uh, next spirals for the products, what do you see next to you know, a very competitive space? A whole range of people are in this. Um, you know, China coming up very, very quick with its own set of uh, products. Uh, you have a lot of commercial entries that are in the market that a lot of people look at and they say, hey, you know, for, for one very high-end militarized system, I can buy a whole bunch of these cheaper commercial ones and just throw them out. What are some of the things you're, you guys are doing to remain commercially viable and attractive for folks like, like Colonel Green? Yeah, sure, it's a good question. I think um, the way we think about it, and actually what we deliver to our customers is value, while the visible thing has wings and an engine and carries you know, big expensive payloads, it's really the information that matters, right? So we've been investing and we've been developing capabilities that extend beyond the airplane, beyond the payload, beyond the radio, beyond the GCS, right? Uh, investing in things like machine learning, computer vision, Right, so that we can start to provide tools to our customers so we can do more automation of the data analysis and the data distribution tasks because as we put more airplanes in the sky and we put more cameras in the sky, all we're doing is producing more data, more raw data. But actually, raw data isn't necessarily valuable to anybody. You have to be able to derive answers and information from that data. So building these toolkits gives us a suite of capabilities from, we like to say, glass to glass, right? From the glass of a sensor to the glass of a monitor or a mobile device so that a decision maker can go actually do their jobs with the right relevant geotemporal uh, information. Colonel Green, how are you guys working through the information overload challenge, right? Um, if, you, if you've got multiple devices up doing multiple things, you're gathering a lot of data. Is that a challenge in terms of being able to go through all the imagery, select what you want, and don't get information overload? It is a challenge. We incorporate Intel analysts into our flight crews, so that's a one big way that we do that. And we also coordinate directly with the unit that we're supporting. So we have very high situational awareness when we're out there, and the blackjacks help, helps provide that queuing for us. 
what are some novel ways you're thinking about using the system? How is it changing the way you guys do business? And, and where do you want to be five years from now from operationally um, with your unit and its capabilities? So one thing we look at is the different payload sets. So of course it's got the camera, that's what everybody thinks about a ISR platform, but we're also able to incorporate several different types of payloads to include different types of electronic warfare, uh, particularly uh, s signals intelligence, and we're able to pull that information, analyze it, and put it out to our end users and uh, really affect the decision-making process for our, our guys on the ground. I'm, 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 I'm amazed you didn't use the word Intrepid Tiger II as part of that, uh, as part of that plan, but that's uh, part of the Marine Corps' ambitious plan to distribute electronic warfare assets across the, across the force. How game-changing is that going to be from your standpoint to have that kind of a capability on an unmanned aerial vehicle that's very expeditionary in nature? I think it will change a lot of things. We'll be able to um, provide a lot of information and pass a lot of information to uh, not just the guys on the ground, but also to the other aircraft and the decision makers across the battle space. And John, let me bring it back home with you. This is a price sensitive market. Um, so capability is one thing. What are some guys, uh, things you guys are doing, whether on manufacturing and elsewhere, where you're trying to take costs out of the product, but also try to improve it. I mean, folks have a tendency of thinking that, well, you know, it's it's not worth the cost. Almost anything can be improved, and it's amazing how much cost you can take it take out of something, especially when you have take a very fresh look at its design. Mm -hmm. Well, like any manufacturer, I mean, management of your supply chain is critical to keeping your costs in check. But I think the other thing I would bring to bear on this is the amount of experience we have actually operating air vehicles ourselves. So when it comes to a customer like the Marine Corps, who's an acquisition customer. Um, we can incorporate lessons learned from our million hours of flying ourselves um, into the design of the product, into the manufacturing of the product, into the maintainability of the product, such that all of those things that you just mentioned that you know cumulatively can add up to significant cost increases, we can mitigate very early in the process to, to be able to provide an efficient product. And, and although Colonel uh, Green uh, specifies sort of the classic, the heart of the company, talk to us a little bit also about commercial growth uh, opportunities. You see almost everybody here, even defense contractors, are looking at commercial growth opportunities uh, across a whole whole range of, uh, of areas. Talk to us a little bit about your commercial growth strategy. Yeah, sure. So if you look at the commercial, let's say, aerial remote sensing market, um, you can buy imagery off of a satellite, commercial satellite company. Uh, you can fly a small group one you know, quadcopter if you want, but there's a gap in the middle, right? And that gap is a combination of ground sample distance resolution that you can't get from overhead imagery that's commercially available, um, and the area and the distance that you might need to cover that you can't effectively do with a quadcopter that has a 30 minute endurance. So there's this sweet spot in the middle that um, aligns very well with our air vehicle capabilities, but it really comes back to, to my other answer to your question about it's investment in the capabilities to get to the information product, right? It's not about just the data. Um, someone once said data is the new oil. Well, I actually kind of disagree because data in and of itself is not terribly valuable, right? You have to add insight to that data. You have to couple it with the expertise and the use case to be able to derive the information, the decision product that you need out of that. So in that way, our approach to investment and development is exactly the same. Right? We need to build more toolkits and a platform of capabilities, not an air vehicle platform, a platform in terms of a toolbox that allows people to derive that kind of uh, decision information. And, and what's the size of that market? What's the addressable size? And what, how big of a piece of that do you want? Jeez, uh, all of it? How about that? <laughs> um, no, I mean, it's, it's massive, right? And, and it's just going to continue to grow. As a matter of fact, I think it's right to ask that question in that way as opposed to say, how big is the commercial drone market going to be? Because unmanned's not always the solution, right? I, I mean, a camera on top of a pole might be the right solution to gather the right data. So in a lot of ways, even though we're largely an airplane company, we're kind of agnostic to the way you collect the data. Um, and our focus has increasingly become what do you do with that information and how do you combine it with other information to enable the decision. I almost want to ask whether or not you want to get out of the commercial drone, you, you want to get out of the drone business at some point and just become an inf information analysis and fusion company. I, I think we already are that. Um, the interesting thing about you know, unmanned aviation is that there is, there's an economic benefit to being able to operate many air vehicles simultaneously without having to add a human or more than one human for every one of those vehicles, right? So that's really where we're headed. Um, there's a lot of regulatory work that still has to be done. Uh, I would say the FAA and other international 
regulatory bodies are actually leaning forward quite nicely and co collaborating with industry to try to make that happen. Um, but there's some specific milestones we need to breach, right? One is how does the community, how does the regulator get their head wrapped around a single operator in control of two vehicles in the air? Right? There's absolutely nothing in the regs that talks about any of that. And this is, this is new ground, right? How do you address flight over people? How about nighttime beyond line of sight? How about command and control over SATCOM that's not remotely piloted, but is instead click waypoints and the airplane goes and semi-autonomously does its own navigation? So there's all of these things that the community's leaning into uh, so that we can deliver that promise of unmanned. Until then, we'll operate manned aircraft. You know, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll put payloads on the wing of a Cessna um, because it's about getting that information product. I, I like how you did that pilot thing right there. It was, it was really good. Yeah. Uh, you know how you can tell a pilot in a room, right? Go on. Don't worry, he'll tell you. <laughs> and, and, and he just did, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, and let me, let me just ask you, Colonel, one thing. Uh, you know, you, uh, John spends his time going to these trade shows, whereas I think you probably spend a little bit less time going to these. How, you know, how valuable has been DSCI for you, getting a chance to go around, look around, see what's new in the zoo uh, while you've been here? Well, I think it's been very valuable. I've been able to look at a different uh, set of problems from how we normally view them and look at the other assets that are out there that we might be able to take advantage of. So it's been very useful. Are you going to go home with a shopping list? And, and, and I've got a few things I'm uh, looking to talk about <laughs> when I get back, yeah. What did you think was the most in one of the more interesting things you saw here over the course of the week? Um, honestly, some of the clothing. Uh, was was interesting because uh, we're getting ready to go do cold weather operations, right? And then uh, some of the data collaboration uh, tools that were out there. Awesome, Colonel. Thanks very much. All the best. Nice to meet you. Thank you very much, John. Thank you. John. Thanks very much again. I really appreciate it. I don't know what I was going to do there. Uh, you know, lost lost my mic discipline there, guys. Thanks very much. We really appreciate it. Much.